that. Haggai chapter number 2, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 4. Haggai chapter 2 and verse 4. The Bible says, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. And be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Lord, we pray now that you would help us as we look at some challenges from this book, Haggai. Thank you for this prophet. Thank you, Lord, for what you leave to us in it by way of challenge in our walk with you in the midst of a time when we need to uh, adhere to your command to work. And so, Lord, may it be. I pray that you would please cleanse me of sin. I pray you'd help me be filled, Lord, with the Spirit that we may be able to preach your word in truth, in clarity and in a way then that would honor you. May we respond to it as well in the same. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Here we find this book, Haggai, and uh, there are some tremendous, uh, uh, you know, uh, he's a minor prophet, and uh, not because his message is minor, just because uh, his book is one of those that were shorter in nature. And uh, one of the things you find very often about the minor prophets is that their message is very to the point. Uh, and um, therefore very helpful uh, to consider as the Lord leads from time to time. Haggai's name means festive or festival, but uh, as we'll see, the ministry to which the Lord called him was no festival at all. Haggai was born in Babylon, and he was the first of three prophets of the Restoration. He was the first prophet through whom God spoke to the post-exilic Jews uh, and ties in very much with uh, many of the uh, uh, principles, precepts uh, that we uh, looked at from Ezra even this morning. Uh, The other two were Zechariah and Malachi. And uh, you think about the importance even just of those two. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament And between his words and the first words of the New Testament, there was a span of 400 years. And so the message that they had was vital. God, if you will, was going to go silent for that span of time. And whatever had been said must be something that would remain with the hearts and minds of the people until they heard, if you will, from the Lord again. And so um, we find... Haggai ministering alongside these other two. And uh, he was a prophet of great faith. Uh, He was used of God to convict the consciences and stir up the enthusiasm of the Jews that were uh, sent by God to rebuild the temple. He came on the scene, of course, by the hand of the Lord at a very critical time in the nation's history, and it was through the pressure, if you will, of his faith, his prayers, and his preaching that the great task of rebuilding the temple was uh, accomplished. And in order to understand uh, the setting, we would want to remember that uh, in uh, 536 B.C., the exiled Jews began to return to the land under the leadership of Zerubbabel and Joshua. And then in 535, these Jews attempted to rebuild the temple but were discouraged and stopped by opposition. 
In 520 B.C., Haggai and Zechariah urged the people to rebuild. And then in 516, the temple was finally finished and dedicated. In 458, Ezra returned, leading some 6,000 more exiles back to the land. And he was followed in 445 by Nehemiah, who returned as the governor of Jerusalem to lead, as you are well aware, in the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. We're reminded in all of that that the accomplishment of God's work is no one person's effort. It is uh, each one being obedient and following the, uh, the leadership and the Spirit of God for the time uh, in which the Lord had engaged them. The same is true for you tonight and for me, that we were not brought into this world by accident. The God of heaven saved us for a purpose in this life, and beyond saving us for a purpose in this life, he puts you in this place at this time in life uh, to accomplish a work for him. And uh, so when the exiles returned to the land after 70 years of captivity, they were eager to set up the public worship of the sanctuary, and that's what we discussed uh, uh, as a portion of the message this morning. So immediately they uh, rebuilt the altar on its old site and they began the plans to rebuild the temple. The foundation of it was laid, uh, but when they refused the Samaritans' help, they, the Samaritans urged the king of Persia to stop the work, and for 15 years nothing was accomplished. The Jews, as a result, began to lose heart and after they lost heart, they became selfish. They began to focus on their own things. Uh, they began to, uh, you know, become very uh, uh, personally oriented and to live for themselves. So the Lord sent Haggai, Zechariah on the scene to encourage them to make the work of the Lord a priority in their life. Uh, and... Uh, so through the years of the church, the books of sermons have been popular from time to time, and some of you probably have books of sermons on your shelf tonight that you may have collected from various uh, uh, individuals, maybe that have come through the church here to preach or ordered from online or some, in book, uh, some bookstore. These have been books of sermons popular now and again, and generally, independent Baptists are not known much for their authorship of books. That's not always the case, uh, but uh, generally that would be true. Uh, and so a closer examination of many of their books reveals that they're really collections of sermons on various topics uh, or maybe on a single topic, and many of those have been a blessing down through the years. Uh, this is no new idea. Haggai's two chapters are literally a book of four pointed messages to the people of God. And the purpose of the book is to show that the work of the Lord, again, was to be a priority in the lives of God's people. He was sent to awaken and encourage them, uh, like we read in Ezra 3 and 8, and to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. In these specifically dated sermons, we see a particular sin that will keep us from accomplishing the will and the work of God at Maranatha Baptist Church. And so by introduction, we come then uh, into this first sermon that Haggai preached in chapter number one. It was a sermon to charge the people of God with selfish living. And again, we're talking about hindrances to the setting forth of the work of the house of the Lord. And obviously, one of the things that would come to our mind, maybe uh, without even being encouraged to consider it, would be, well, if I'm not living for the Lord, I must be living for myself. And so Haggai begins this message in verse number one. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts. Once again, we see uh, a man of God delivering the word of the Lord in verse number one. 
As a matter of fact, when you consider the, entire, uh, the entirety of the book, uh, Haggai was very aware of the divine authority from which he preached. And any preacher would be aware of that, and as a result of that, be cautious, not only in their preparation, but certainly in their presentation of the Word of God. Accurate uh, to the Lord's instruction. No less than 25 times in these two short chapters, Haggai affirmed the divine authority by beginning with, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, and ending his message with, Thus saith the Lord. These references to this divine authority of his messages are scattered throughout them to remind them and to remind now us that God still has something to say in the affairs of men. And it is God's word to which we should listen. And so with regard to this matter of selfishness, we begin by looking at this message dated, if you were to take the uh, the references to various individuals and times, uh, it would have been September 1st, 520 B.C. Sixteen years had passed since the foundation of the temple had been laid and nothing had been done. And the message here was directed to the leaders in verse 1. You see that very clearly there. It, it came to Zerubbabel, the governor, to Joshua, the high priest. And the reason for that, of course, is, as it has been said, everything rises and falls on leadership. And the people could only go as far as those who led them. That's true of a country. That's true of a workplace. That's true of a church. That's also true of a family. And the burden of the responsibility of Genuinely spiritual leadership is clearly laid out here. The message was concerning their procrastination, beginning there in verse number 2. They were saying that now is not the time, uh, or was not the time then, of course, to rebuild the house of the Lord. In verse 2, uh, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, the time is not come the time that the Lord's house should be built. And they were procrastinating to carry the work out. It is uh, sometimes amazing to hear the excuses of those that don't want to serve the Lord, who don't want to accomplish His work for one reason or another. These people had been in captivity for 70 years. They had uh, returned to the land, begun to rebuild, and then sat for 16 years because of opposition, and yet now they were still saying it's not time to rebuild the temple. So many times people are looking for a convenient time or an easy way to serve the Lord. And when we think about that, we should be reminded, first of all, that for lazy and selfish and uncommitted uh, people, convenient days never seem to come, but excuses abound. In Proverbs 22 and 13, the Bible says, The slothful man saith, There's a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. Now, we read by that and we think to ourselves, Well, that's interesting. In reality, it's silly. But that's often the, the, the excuses of the lazy and incompetent. Some silly reason why the work cannot be carried out. Uh, and he refers to this, uh, these... Uh, 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 this type of person is slothful in Proverbs twenty two thirteen. That means, uh, the purpose of the verse means basically that any pretext, no matter how improbable, will be used to indulge the lazy, uncommitted person in his love of ease and in his laziness. Matter of fact, Proverbs 26 and verse 13 says, The slothful man saith, there's a lion in the way, a lion in the streets. As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. And the slothful hideth his hand in his bosom. It grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth. And here's the interesting phrase. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit 
than seven men that can render reason. Isn't that something? Wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render reason. Listen, I pondered about that and I jotted this down. You, you, can, you can mark it down on the authority of the Scriptures that some of the laziest people you'll ever meet are the arrogant know-it-alls. You ever notice that? And uh, they can talk the oxygen out of a room about all that they know, but they're not wise enough to figure out how to get anything done but talking. Furthermore, the uh, devil, by the way, you'll note here that these people had the right words to say, but there was no follow-through. And furthermore, the devil will always make sure that there's never a convenient time to serve the Lord. He will always make sure that there is some distraction in the way, yeah, uh, especially for someone who is committed. You're not worried too much about those that are uncommitted, not worried too much about those that are slothful, but when you find somebody that's got a heart on fire for God that wants to move forward for his glory and set forward the work of the house of the Lord, the devil's going to do everything he can to get in the way. He'll use circumstances. He'll use people. He'll use uh, all kinds of things to try to stop progress in the Lord's house. Paul said, for a great door and effectual is open to me, and there are many adversaries. As a matter of fact, it's often been said that if you're not receiving opposition from Satan, you're not doing anything for the Lord. And so they were saying, now is not the time to rebuild the house. Uh, and, uh, but he said here, they seem to have plenty of time for themselves. In verse 3, then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? And the real reason the people were not busy about the things of the Lord because they were too busy uh, doing things for themselves. They said it wasn't time to build the house of the Lord. And so Haggai said, oh, uh, he said, I see. It's not time to, uh, uh, to, uh, to work for the Lord, but it's time to carry out your selfish plans and purposes, whatever they may be. The people had put themselves before the Lord. As a result, uh, their life was all luxurious. And the Lord's house lay waste we often see that type of approach to the things of the lord today it seemed like fewer and fewer we've said this even recently fewer and fewer people have the heart of sacrifice and commitment of our forebears that built the very places and ministries that we now enjoy and help us the thought of having a better house than the lord's bothered david he said See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. It bothered him. And the reason the house of God uh, goes without in various fashions, uh, while not so much so in the lives of the individual members of the church, is because of apathy for God and selfishness. The temple was their center of worship. And the people's delay in rebuilding the temple was, their, uh, was an indicator of their lack of interest in the things of the Lord. And so, God said, they needed to consider their ways. In verse 5, now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Would you stop just for a moment and think about what you're doing? Uh, and to consider your life before God. We have this particular portion, this verse on the sign out there by the road in the hopes that somebody will heed its words. Consider your ways. And of course, right at the bottom of it is a reference to Scripture reminding people that we don't just consider our ways for our own betterment. We consider our ways because God is watching Everything is naked and open unto him with whom we have to do. And so we need to consider our ways. And that's what Haggai encouraged the people to do. He said, not only consider your ways, stop, 
think, uh, look at your life, uh, but uh, to consider your plight in verse 6. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Consider what's happening to your life as you attempt to live for yourself to the neglect of the service of the Lord. Haggai encouraged the people to look what was going on around them. They were always in need. They, they couldn't seem to find satisfaction in the things they were chasing because of the Lord would not have it in their life. They needed to consider their plight, and they needed to build the house of the Lord. Look at verse 7. Thus said the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And then what? Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house. There are some people that ponder their ways, but they never get around to doing what needs to be done. Haggai said, if you think about what you're doing, then uh, uh, what you're not doing, then you go up and you get some wood and you get to work on the house of the Lord. You make the effort. You do what's necessary. You take those steps. You carry it out. Otherwise, you haven't genuinely considered your ways. And so they needed to consider their plight. They needed to build the house of the Lord. And the Lord said, if you do this, he said, I will take pleasure in it. I will be glorified, saith the Lord. So anytime we put God first, he's pleased with that. And uh, that's why the Bible tells us, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And their failure to rebuild the temple was the reason for their troubles. Their failure to put God first was the reason for the, despite all they were trying to do for themselves, the reason they were having trouble is because they did not have God first in their life. And he says that in verse 9, you looked for much and lo, it came to little and when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, said the Lord of hosts, because of, uh, because of mine house that is waste and ye run every man unto his own house. Watch verse 10. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, upon the mountains, upon the corn, upon the new wine, upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon man, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. They'd come to trouble because God was not first. Now, we move from the message to the response of the people in verse 12. And uh, then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, look now, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. This is a rare highlight <laughs> in an Old Testament that's full of disobedience and waywardness, where the people heard the message and obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, but not only that, look, and the words of Haggai the prophet. You know what concerns me, and it's not, uh, you know, not necessarily because of the role the Lord's called me to, but it concerns me how much preaching goes really unheard. Well, how do you know it's unheard? Because it's unheeded. And yet here the Bible says that, and I like the way they... Uh, the Lord uh, puts this, he, they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. Look, and the words of Haggai the prophet. It, and what were Haggai's words? Thus saith the Lord. So it wasn't as if Haggai was coming up with his own philosophies. It wasn't as if he was, uh, uh, you know, trying to exalt himself. He was declaring unto them the word of the Lord. And then he says in verse, this, it continues in verse 12, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. They obeyed the Lord, they obeyed the preached word, and they feared the Lord. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the beginning of knowledge. And of course, the reason people from situation to situation don't obey the Lord is 
um, uh, and to sin is, uh, so willfully is because there is no fear of God before their eyes. And the reason there is no fear of God before their eyes is because they have forgotten that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so the result we find in verse 13, we find the message, we find the response and beginning in, in verse 12, and then we find the result beginning in verse number 13. And the result of their obedience was that the Lord was with them. Verse 13 says, Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, and the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. You know there's a great deal of grace in that verse. After they had lived for themselves and neglected his house, the Lord was faithful to send the prophet to them and declare to them of their sin. And when they responded to that declaration in the way that God would expect, he forgave them, he restored them, and he walked with them. And the same thing can be true for you tonight in your relationship and walk and work with the Lord. The Lord was with them and not only that, but he went on to empower them. In verse 14, And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. I mean, and I like that phrase, they got stirred up. They said, hey, God's promised to forgive us and God's promised to bless us if we get busy about the work of the house of the Lord. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, in the 4 and 20th day. The Lord stirred them up. Amen. There's a world of difference between that and carnal stirring for sure. Carnal stirring doesn't get anything done. The spirit stirring moved them to get the work accomplished. And they set to work for the Lord. And so selfishness could have been the title of Haggai's first sermon. But then uh, he, uh, he, he moved on seven weeks later in chapter 2 and verse 1 and preached a sermon on looking back. Now, if you were here this morning, you know we discussed this very thing in the morning hour. And so I wouldn't want to linger on it too much tonight, but... Uh, he began to show the difference between their vision and God's vision. Their vision is in verse, uh, verse number 2, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtel, the governor of Judah, to Joshua, the son of Joseph, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and... Be strong, Joshua, son of Josedek, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you. They were looking at, at the glory of the past temple and comparing it with the uh, disaster of the current one. And we know from Nehemiah that there were a lot of people that looked at the work that had to be done and were overwhelmed by it. They said there's too much rubble, there's too much work to be done, and uh, it'll never happen. But it did, didn't it? And you know how it happened? Well, you had Nehemiah there, and uh, he was declaring them, uh, to them the good hand of God that was on him to bring him there for such a time as that. You had Ezra that talked about God's blessing on him. Uh, you had Haggai here, Zechariah. I mean, there they were saying, God is in this thing if you will obey. And so they preached and encouraged and stirred them up. And then all of a sudden, somebody moved the first stone. Somebody cleared the first piece of rubble, and the work began. And 52 days later, the walls were rebuilt. You see, they were looking at the glory of the past temple. And as we said this morning, it's a dangerous to live in the past. Our Lord said, don't put your hand in the plow and look back. Makes you unfit for the kingdom of God. So we see their vision, then we see God's vision in verse number four. Not that they should look back, but that they should look forward. Yes, the work is going to be hard, and yes, the challenge is great. But he said, I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, work. They needed to be strong. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. 
And then they needed to work because of God's presence, we said in verse number four, and because of his promises in verse number five, when he said, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. <laughs> Man, he went back a ways. So my spirit, look at this, remaineth among you. Wow. Fear ye not. Oh, the faithfulness of our God. Even in the midst of our disobedience and uh, even in the midst of our laziness and waywardness, yet the Lord said, look, I haven't left you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. It doesn't give us any uh, obvious uh, 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 justification for not carrying out the work of the Lord. That's for sure. But God knows that the, uh, the presence of his spirit is part of the promise that is given to us to keep us moving in the work of the Lord. So they needed to look to the future in uh, verse number 6. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. You know, one of these days, Jesus is going to walk in there. Can you imagine that? Now, what if you and I were doing that work? What if we knew tonight that Jesus was going to walk in? Don't you reckon we'd be motivated? <laughs> Don't you reckon, hey, uh, that we'd be a little more committed to the house of the Lord maybe than we are now? They needed to look to the future. The Lord said, look, he basically, he basically reminds them that this world is not our home. We're just passing through. And this temple that you're rebuilding is not going to attain to the former glory, but the fact of the matter is the one that's coming will excel them all. And in those words, he reminds us to keep our eyes on heaven as we work. Amen. The promise of our future glory. So his first sermon entitled Selfishness, his second term in, uh, sermon entitled uh, Looking Back, his third sermon deals with unconfessed sin. And it was preached December 24th. That's Christmas Eve. And uh, many of us would be thinking about and preaching on a babe in a manger. Uh, of course, there wasn't any Christmases this time. Hold on. But Haggai is preaching on unconfessed sin. By the way, they tie together, don't they? Because he came to be made sin for us. Who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. They began to preach about the fact that they had sin in their life. And uh, in, in verse number 10, he, he says, In the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord to Haggai, by the, uh, Haggai the prophet, saying, This saith the Lord of hosts. Watch now. Ask now the priest concerning the law, saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said, No. So you got a defiled man touching the holy things of the Lord. Um, does that make him holy? Verse 13, Then said Haggai, If one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these things shall it be unclean and the priest answered and said it shall be unclean and so then answered Haggai and said so is this people and so is this nation before me saith the Lord and so is every work of their hands and that which they offer there is unclean if a garment he said is uh, used to carry sanctified flesh to be used in an offering touches any other element, does it make that second element holy? That's the question here. The answer, of course, was no, as we read. And so the second question, again, if a defiled person touches another element, does it make that other element unclean? The answer was yes. And so to this question, he gives a comparison in verse number 14 when he says, Then answered Haggai and said, So is this people and so is this nation before me. He said, that which they offer here is unclean. And now I pray you consider from this day forward and, up, uh, and upward from before a stone was laid upon the stone in the temple of the Lord. Since those days were when one came to, uh, uh, came to an heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the, uh, 
press fat for to draw out 50 vessels out of the press. There were but 20. I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail in all the labors of your hands. Yet ye turned not to me, saith the Lord. And so he begins to make application to the people. The people's disobedience had rendered their worship unacceptable before God. This is the danger of becoming accustomed to holy things. This is the danger of presuming upon the grace of God that somehow or another you and I begin to think that maybe holiness, personal holiness, as it connects to our service is not as important. But the Lord reminds us that it is. And that you and I in an undefiled state cannot be used in a holy work. But he said here as well uh, that when our heart is unclean, our work is unclean. And then you see in verse 15, now I pray you consider from this day upward, and he talks about the judgment that was on them, how that God had uh, hindered and hurt, uh, waylaid them, if you will, because of their lack of holiness in service. But their faithful continuance in obedience would open the floodgates of God's blessing. Verse 19, he said, or verse 18 said, Consider now from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it, is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, as yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree uh, hath not brought forth from this day will I bless you from what day from the day we genuinely make our heart thoroughly right with God from the day that we seek his cleansing and forgiveness for our sin you and I should be very careful about presuming as I said upon his grace and his mercy if our heart is unclean our work is unclean but when our heart is clean before him, his blessing will be upon us. His final sermon, Haggai then, having preached in selfishness and looking back in unconfessed sin, his final message was one of faithlessness. Beginning in verse 20, and again the word of the Lord came into Haggai in, four, in the four and twentieth day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overflow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of kingdoms of the heathen. I will overthrow the chariots that, uh, of, uh, and those that ride in them. And the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, saith the Lord, and will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. It's possible that the leaders here had become disturbed by the threatening of the nations around them to the point of it hindering them from working forward for the Lord. Uh, circumstances always have a way of doing that in our life if we're not careful. And certainly the leaders needed to be reminded that the work is not yours, it's the Lord. Isn't that what David said when he went to challenge the people that were, uh, when he went out there with Goliath uh, and uh, they were cowering behind rocks and it, uh, David got a little stirred up and says, what are, you, what are you doing? He said, is there not a cause? And then he went and told the king, Saul, he said, I'll go and fight the giant. <laughs> the king wasn't very uh, enthusiastic about that, to say the least. He said, you're just a youth. And that guy, that guy's a man of war from you. From, you've been herding sheep. That guy's been killing people. All right, then. We've got to do something to help you, though. So they put Saul's armor on him. And if you'll remember from last Sunday night, Saul was head and shoulders above every man in Israel. Uh, which means he was a tall guy. <laughs> and David was a youth. You got to think about what David must have looked like in that armor. <laughs> and he said, I can't go with this. You and I wouldn't have either. Uh, he said, uh, I got to get this off. And so he took it off. And he went and got five smooth stones in a sling. That's what he used out with those sheep. He killed a lion. I mean, he killed a lion and a bear with his own hands out there. He didn't have any of Saul's armor then either. And then he went out there before Goliath, and Goliath said, what is this, a joke? Are you going to send this little boy to me? 
And David said, uh, hey, it's not me you got to worry about. He said, uh, he said, it's not my fight. This is the battle. He said, the, the battle is the Lord's. And he didn't say that he was going to. He said, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. That's the same kind of faith that, uh, that uh, Haggai was hoping to see uh, in Zerubbabel uh, and, uh, 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 and the leaders of that time, that they might have faith in God. And that God then would use them as a result. He said, I'll make you a signet here. A testimony of the power of God. Isn't that what you want to be? You want to be a testimony of the power of God? I'm going to tell you one thing. Uh, there are, we've, we've talked so much and preached so much because we're living in a day where everybody's worried about their own reputation. Hey, man, I don't want my reputation. Uh, I want the testimony of the Lord and his power. And his grace, and his mercy, and his love, and his faithfulness. I want that the testimony of my life. Amen. Matter of fact, the Bible says if we're faithful to him, that one day he, <laughs> we will be presented as trophies of his grace. Hmm. And so the encouragement here was to have, don't be faithless, but believing. You're a chosen vessel. It's not a mistake. That you are where you are, when you are, and how you are. God's got you there for a purpose. And so, therefore, don't give up. It was a big work. We found in several prophets through this time, several leaders of the nation of Israel, it was not going to be done by any one person. God wanted it to go forward by the work of every person for his glory. The same thing's true at Maranatha Baptist Church. It's not the work of any one person. It's the work of us all by the hand of our God. And God said, if, if you'll refuse to live for yourself, if you'll be careful not to look back but to look forward, if you'll be careful to keep yourself clean from sin, and if you have faith in me, he said, I'll make you as a signet, a testimony of his power and of his grace. And so, if not, then the Bible tells us in Galatians 6 and 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Let's stand together, please, and bow our heads for prayer. You remember the phrase in Nehemiah was, rise up and build. <laughs> the phrase of Haggai is, rise up and work. Stop putting off the things that need to be done in the house of the Lord. Get busy about being faithful to the work of God, and God will help see you through. God will bless your life. But as long as you continue to live for yourself, to make excuses, though very reasoned they may be, the hand of God will be uh, restricted from us. Lord, help us tonight to consider the message of Haggai, a timely message in a day when in so many ways our churches are struggling. Help us, Lord, we pray, by the power of your uh, word and spirit through this prophet to be challenged to be a working people, to lay aside excuses, to bring some wood, and to build the house. Use us, Lord, we pray. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen.